Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Christy Ebay. I'm a professor in the School of Public Health at the University of Washington. I'm also co-chair of Iconics. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking with you about regional and sectoral extensions to the shared socioeconomic pathways. The SSPs were structured from the beginning so that the narratives and the quantification would provide information that is sufficient to locate an SSP within the space of challenges to adaptation and mitigation. The SSPs were also structured from the beginning to facilitate extensions of those basic SSPs to add additional information that's relevant for particular analytic questions. Adding additional information, for example, so that one could look at risks within a region or provide more detailed quantifications to look within a sector and globally to add additional information that is relevant for particular decisions that have to be taken, for example. Brian O'Neill published a paper a few months ago looking at the achievements of the RCP SSP framework. This figure from that paper shows you over the six year period covered in the analyses, there were nearly 1400 analyses using the SSPs. You can see that about half of the applications of the SSPs were for impacts and adaptation. About a third were for drivers or mitigation. There's some publications on multiple topics. There's some publications providing extensions and some publications looking at methods themselves. With such a rich literature base, which continues to grow, I will just cherry pick a few examples of the richness of what has been done to give you some ideas of where you could start doing your own analyses to continue building on the SSPs to make them even more relevant for decision making. Population is central to the extent of many of the risks that are projected. So there's multiple publications looking at how population could change under different SSPs. This shows you change in the numbers of people in parts of Asia, the Arab Peninsula, and parts of Africa between 2015 and 2090 under SSP1 and SSP3. You can see very clearly that in SSP1 at the top, a world aiming to sustainable development, there would be far fewer people than a world that continues along current trends. A different approach was taken for looking at population density in the United States. The maps on the right show you under the three SSPs listed how population density could change between 2010 and 2070. The map at the top, SSP3, a world with high levels of regional rivalry, could see declines in population density in parts of the Northeast and the Midwest. At the same time, if the world is under SSP5, if we are a world that uses fossil fuel primarily for development, you can see much higher population density. And that has implications then for how we think about what risks there could be, for example, from heat-related mortality. Understanding populations also under important for understanding various kinds of exposures, in this case, wildfire emissions, towards the end of the century under two RCPs and five population scenarios to show the important role that population plays in thinking about what could happen with our wildfire emissions. More recent publications are using the combinations of RCPs and SSPs. In this case, for changes in precipitation over three time periods, in China, humid and semi-humid regions, and in arid and semi-arid regions. If you look at the arid and semi-arid regions at the end of the century, you can see a very large difference in terms of projected changes in precipitation between SSP1, RCP 1.9, SSP 5, RCP 8.5. So understanding the interplay 
between our development patterns and our emissions is going to be very important for understanding the magnitude and pattern of possible risks in the future. This is an example that illustrates that particular point. Nigel Arnell and colleagues looked at global impact indicators in 2050 and in 2100 for 21 different metrics. I pulled out just a few of those for this slide. You can see for 2050 at the top, 2100 at the bottom. And the top row, you can see different metrics related to heat waves, the row underneath that different metrics related to water stress. For each one of these, there's three RCPs that were investigated, 2.6, 4.5, and 8.5. And without looking in detail, just visually looking at the SSPs within each RCP, you can see very different patterns. Again, we have to understand this interplay between changes in our climate and changes in our development if we're going to understand what kinds of risks we're going to be facing as the climate and our development continue to change. There's quite a lot of work being done on ecosystems. This is one piece of work that was looking at tire conservation landscapes and how those landscapes could shift under the different SSPs. The map is just for SSP1 the maps for other SSPs look very different. And that's because some of the key elements in the SSPs provide information about the extent to which populations could prioritize tiger conservation, depending on the characteristics of the development patterns. There's a growing literature base on what the SSPs in combination with the RCPs could mean for human health and well-being. This shows you a map, a series of maps on the left for the mosquito Aedes aegypti. This mosquito can carry dengue fever, yellow fever, Zika virus, and chikungunya. As the temperatures increase, in this case under RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5, you can see quite significant differences in the expansion of the geographic range of this mosquito. On the right shows you for the four different types of dengue fever, the global population affected in millions. If you look at the bottom at all types, on the left is just the gridded population. And then you can see for SSP3 for the two different RCPs and also for SSP5, when you look at this pattern, you can see that in the case of dengue fever, understanding what is likely to happen with our development pattern is more important than understanding what might happen with climate change, that our development pattern is going to have a bigger impact on future possible burdens of dengue fever than temperature change, although temperature change also is critically important. Several publications are trying to integrate across a variety of impact factors. This particular publication by Ed Byers looked across 14 impact indicators to understand global population exposure and vulnerability to poverty in 2050. If you look across the top row, these three figures are a world that is under SSP2. We continue along our current development patterns. And you can see as temperature increases, from 1.5 degrees to 3 degrees C above pre-industrial, a very large increase in the number of people exposed and vulnerable to poverty. The figures across the bottom show a world that is going to achieve 2 degrees C above pre-industrial. So we've held constant the temperature change. And then you can see under SSP 1, 2, and 3, as you look across these SSPs, a very large increase in the number of people exposed and vulnerable to poverty. As you look at these figures, they tell you how important it is, again, to understand not just temperature change, but also the changes in our development patterns, because these are going to interact in ways that will determine the magnitude and pattern of future risks. 
The kinds of publications I've shown you are then assessed in reports by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. As is traditional in Working Group 2, burning embers are developed to synthesize the risks with increasing global mean surface temperature. I highlighted this particular figure because you can see for desertification, land degradation, and food insecurity that there is this interplay between increases in temperature and our development choices. And so again, the magnitude of our future risk will depend on both factors, how much greenhouse gases we emit and what choices we make for our development. There's a number of publications that are looking at adaptation. This is some work that we did looking at what the SSPs could tell us about the effectiveness of our health services to be able to address increases in the number of cases of climate sensitive health outcomes, for example. And there's very different patterns across the different key elements of a health system. And we can use that information then in our analyses. The SSPs have been used to inform developing similar kinds of pathways for other systems. This example is for ocean system pathways, showing that understanding the economy, governance, and management can help understand what could happen with ocean systems then in combination with what happens under the RCPs in terms of temperature change, ocean acidification, and other factors. These two studies highlight work that is being done taking the RCPs and using stakeholder processes to, on the left, develop socioeconomic pathways for Tokyo in 2050. And on the right, some scenarios are being used in New Zealand to inform priorities for research investment to help understand the kinds of decisions that will be taken in New Zealand. There's a lot of other work that's being done at this kind of scale, from the city to the national scale, in urban areas to look at the kinds of interactions between our development and climate change. I hope this has given you some ideas of the kinds of research that you could undertake. There is a lot that is still to be explored. There's lots of potential for people to go out and conduct additional analyses, extending the SSPs for regions and for sectors to provide more useful information for decision making. Thank you very much for listening and I look forward to your questions.